Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Dr. JJ Rawlinson, and I'm the Senior Manager of Community Partnerships and Welfare Initiatives at Annenberg Pet Space. We are proud to bring you a new session of our ongoing Pet Space Wellness Workshop Series. This series is designed to directly help you strengthen the human animal bond between you and your pets through the guidance of animal experts who will explore practical everyday issues for pet parents. We are happy to welcome Dr. Tina Wismer today, who will be sharing helpful ways to keep our pets safe and out of trouble during the holiday season. We'll begin with a presentation by Dr. Wismer and we'll have time for a Q&A afterwards. So please hold your questions until the end. Before we begin, we'd love to remind you that we are currently offering on-site adoptions, but by appointment only, and have a lot of great upcoming programs, including a super fun holiday kids party next weekend. I'll share a little bit more on that after the session, and you can take a look at our website at annenbergpetspace.org for more details. Now, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Tina Wismer, who is the medical director at the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center. Dr. Tina Wismer worked in both small animal and emergency practice before joining the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center in 1998. And Dr. Wismer is a diplomat of the American Board of Toxicology and the American Board of Veterinary Toxicology. So please help me and join me in welcoming Dr. Tina Wismer. Thank you. Hello, so, doctor. Hi. So the photo, of course, has my pre-COVID hair. This is my pretty much real hair color now. So. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. So I think I'll share my screen and we'll get started here. So we're gonna to talk today about holiday hazards. And this is going to range from things like dangerous decorations, poisonous plants, murderous medications, toxic treats, and cantankerous cleaners. If you can't tell, I do really like alliteration. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. So many of you have probably heard, oh, XYZ is poisonous to your pets. My goal here today is to tell you, yes, it is poisonous to your pets and potentially why, right? A little bit of science behind why some of these things that are fine for you and I are potentially poisonous to our pets. So let's get started. So we're first going to talk about something that's not poisonous, um, but has been actually um, on people's minds lately because of this recent YouTube video. If you haven't seen it, I'm going to play it for you. So this is what can happen when we leave open flames around with pets. So this is actually like the most chill cat ever, right? If this kitty had been at my house, you know, she would have been running throughout the house, setting everything on fire. And amazingly, it goes out on its own. And the cat is just fine. And here at the end, we see the owner kind of running back in, probably because, you know, the smell of burning hair is pretty uh, distinctive here. Okay. So no open flames around our pets, please. Now, sometimes we don't have open flames, right? But we like things to smell good. Um, you know, there's nothing better than, you know, a house that smells like baking bread or cinnamon or, or pine trees. So when we talk about potpourri, we have different types of potpourri. When we think about things like um, the potpourri that's like pieces of, you know, plant material, pine cones and that type of thing, it has a little bit of essential oils on it. Those are relatively safe around our pets, but they can potentially be a foreign body right? I mean, they could get stuck in their intestinal tract and cause some vomiting. The ones we really have to be concerned about are these liquid potpourris. And certainly if it's hot, we can see thermal burns, um, just like we can with our candles. But liquid potpourri is a combination of essential oils and something called cationic detergents. And these are actually cleaning agents. And we'll talk about them more when we talk about um, cleaning stuff at the end of our talk here. And these cleaning agents can actually cause chemical burns. Um, so this is a poor kitty who has, you know, knocked this container over and has licked some of this off of our fur and ends up with this chemical burn. 
So certainly our kitty's gonna need some medical care. Now, another big comment or question we get are essential oils and especially essential oil diffusers, right? Can I use these in my household around my pets? And the answer is in most cases, yes. However, there are definitely some caveats. We don't wanna use these if we have birds in the house. Um, birds, of course, have that very special respiratory tract with not only lungs, but also air sacs. And they're definitely at risk for aerosolized uh, scents. So we don't wanna use these around birds. Um, if you have a cat that has asthma, no essential oil diffusers, please. That can really irritate their respiratory tract. And what I do want to make sure that people realize is that, you know, your dog and your cat has a much, much more developed sense of smell than you or I do. And I kind of liken it to, you know, being trapped on the airplane next to that man with too much cologne or that woman wearing too much perfume. It's not the most pleasant thing. So if you are going to use these in your home, make sure there's an area that the pets can get away from it or certainly don't run it 24 hours a day. But toxicity wise, it's not really that much of a problem. So what about Christmas trees? So there's some places online that are like, oh my gosh, Christmas trees are poisonous. Well, no, but they can potentially cause problems. Um, when we think about pine needles, and of course these are the real trees, um, pine needles themselves can actually get lodged in the digestive tract and cause potentially a foreign body. So not poisonous, but potentially dangerous for your animals here. And the needles themselves, of course, can cause vomiting. What we really run into problems with are things that we put on the tree, right? Anything that's long and thin, can potentially be what we call a linear foreign body. And these are objects that can get stuck in the intestinal tract that actually make the intestines like telescope upon themselves and they can cause the intestinal tract to rupture. So tinsel is probably the worst. Um, it's either metal or plastic based and that's really, really rough on the intestines as it's going through. Uh, ribbon, of course, is bad. That tends to be our cats like to eat ribbon. And uh, with dogs, you know, if you want to go all natural decorations and, okay, we're going to thread the popcorn on the string, please don't if you have dogs um, because they will eat the popcorn and the string and that string can get caught in their intestinal tract. So what that actually looks like um, on x-rays, if we look here at the uh, photo on the left, we can see that the intestines look almost like they're pleated and intestines shouldn't normally look like that. And in surgery, we can see that these intestines have telescoped upon itself. And what we need to worry about is that every little place that this has happened, our piece of tinsel or ribbon could have cut through our intestines and they could be leaking into the abdomen. So definitely no tinsel, um, especially if you've got cats. So let's talk about something that's not really a problem, uh, silica gel. This is actually the number one phone call to human poison control on uh, Christmas day. And we find these packets in, you know, things like leather goods or electronics. They're made to actually absorb um, moisture, right? So keep things from getting uh, moldy or, you know, from getting ruined like your electronics. People, tend to get very concerned about this because it says right there on the container, do not eat, right? Fortunately, they're not poisonous, right? They just have to put do not eat on here because it is not a food substance. And sometimes these are used um, in items that are edible. So if you've ever used one of the crystal cat litters, um, those are actually really large um, granules of silica gel. And if it's safe enough to use for cat litter, you know, it's got to be pretty safe stuff here. So not that much of a problem. Um, if animals eat these, at worst, you could potentially see some stomach upset. But don't worry about the silica gel. Another thing that we don't really have to worry about is the poinsettia, right? When I grew up, I was told that poinsettias would kill your dogs and cats. 
that has been shown to not be true. Um, it actually all goes back um, to the early uh, 1920s when a child in Hawaii did actually pass away after eating poinsettia. But the important part of the story is he also ate many other plants that we do know are actually quite toxic. So if your dog or cat gets a hold of one of these leaves, they may have a little bit of stomach upset, but it's certainly not going to kill them. So definitely overrated. Now, on the other end of the spectrum are members of the true lily family, Lilium and Hemerocallus. These are very dangerous for cats, a bite, grooming the pollen off of themselves, right? Chewing on the leaf is enough to cause kidney failure in cats here. So if you have cats that are exposed to any of these true lilies, they do need to see the veterinarian immediately. Our lily calls to poison control are really, really up this year. And I think one of the reasons is because you and I can't go visit our family members, right? Because of COVID, what do we do? We send them flowers to let them know, hey, thinking about you. And unfortunately, um, people don't know that members of the true lily family are extremely poisonous to cats. Um, so if you are sending a bouquet to someone who does have cats, let the florist know that you need a pet safe bouquet and they'll replace the lilies uh, with something else. Okay. So when a cat gets into a lily, they usually start by vomiting first, and that happens usually within about the first two to six hours, and then they go into kidney failure um, at about 24 hours to about 72 hours afterwards. So we don't know what the toxin is in the plant. Um, we do know that it's found throughout the plant, in the pollen, and we also know what it does in the body. So. If we look, this is uh, one of our fancy kidney uh, nephrons here, right? The functional unit in our kidneys. And what happens is, you know, the blood is pumped in, the liquid part gets squeezed out, it becomes more concentrated and it becomes urine. And then it goes out the kidney down into the bladder where it's excreting. So we know that whatever the toxin is in lilies, it gets concentrated in this proximal tubule here, and it destroys the tubular cells. So the reason cats go into kidney failure is when these cells die, they block the tubules. And when those tubules are blocked, no urine can get out, and our cats die from kidney failure. Now, the good news is, if this does happen in your household, oh my gosh, you know, uh, 1-800-Flowers or Teleflorist delivered this bouquet. I didn't know my cat has been exposed. If you get your kitties to the vet in about the first 18 hours after they've been exposed and you start them on fluids, they do really well. And what happens is we put them on a high rate of fluids. So it keeps this tubule from becoming blocked, right? It kind of flushes out that debris and our cats do fine and the cells will regrow in a couple of weeks. So if you can get them in within the first 18 hours, perfect. Now, what kind of lilies, right? Because lily is a common name for a lot of different plants. And when we think about lilies, it's gotta be a true lily. So it's gotta be lilium or hemerocallus, okay? So this is gonna be most of our popular lilies like Easter lilies or uh, tiger lilies or those beautiful stargazer lilies. Now, there is some question about day lilies, which is hemerocallus, because these are actually edible for people, right? People will put the little leaves um, or excuse me, the petals on a salad. It tastes very citrusy. So why can people eat them but cats have a problem and we don't really know. However, we also know that if cows eat the roots of the daylily plants, it causes blindness. So it's just a species difference. So if you've got cats, no lilies, please. Okay, so let's talk about food, right? That truly is my favorite part of any holiday is food. Um, Please remember, if you are sending food gifts, um, 
you know, let the person know that it's food so that they don't put it under the tree and they don't find up, wake up in the morning to the dog having eaten that box of expensive chocolates that you've just gifted someone. Okay. Dogs can sniff through wrapping paper pretty darn easily um, and they will eat what they enjoy. So just be careful if you're giving gifts that are food. So we're going to start out our potentially toxic foods with grapes and raisins. So grapes and raisins can cause kidney failure in dogs. Now, once again, we don't know what the toxic principle is. We do know that it's in the fleshy part of the grape. So animals that get into like grape seed oil, it's not a problem. Animals that eat like grape leaves, um, also not an issue. Or processed grape products. So things like jellies and jams and wine are not an issue from causing kidney failure. Wine, of course, could get them drunk, but it's not going to affect their kidneys. Um, so there's a question, what is it in grapes and raisins, right? Is it potentially a mold or a mycotoxin that we haven't identified yet? Or is it potentially something genetic? Because some dogs will have problems and some dogs won't, okay? So we never know which dogs are going to have problems. And the issue in veterinary medicine is, of course, we don't routinely do kidney transplants in dogs, so many times we go ahead and treat these guys so they don't develop kidney failure. So this is that same nephron, and notice that the same area is circled here. So the same area that um, Lily caused problems in cats, grapes and raisins affect in dogs, right? That place where that urine is getting concentrated. So how much is too much? We know that 0.7 ounces per kilo of grapes and 0.1 ounces per kilo of raisins is enough to cause problems. So to put that in perspective, um, your 20 pound dog, if it eats one of those little snack packs of raisins, um, that's enough to put them over a dose of concern. Um, and a snack pack has about usually 60, six zero raisins in it. Now, there are definitely some anecdotal stories with, you know, my dog ate one grape or my dog ate one raisin and it went into kidney failure. And we do have, um, we don't have any of those actually documented um, in the literature. And one of the problems we find out with grapes and raisins is owners will tell us that, hey, my dog ate five grapes, we induce vomiting and we get back like 10 grapes. Right, so we know they're not reproducing in the stomach, so sometimes our history is a little suspect here, okay? But we treat grapes and raisins in dogs just like we treat lilies and cats, and the answer is IV fluids to protect our kidneys. Now, xylitol is something that we've been seeing more of over the past few years, and xylitol is a sugar alcohol um, and we find it very commonly in things like sugar-free gum. Um, we can also find it in things like um, toothpaste. You can find it powdered for baking, and we can find it in some of our like quick dissolve medications here. So in people, xylitol is a great thing, right? If you're diabetic, it doesn't cause your blood sugar to go up. It doesn't affect insulin secretion. If you're a child, right, you can chew the sugar-free gum and the bacteria in your mouth can't use xylitol so they don't make um, cavities or you don't get ear infections. So if you're a person, xylitol is very, very safe. Um, same way if you're a cat. The issue is just dogs. So with dogs, what happens with xylitol is when they ingest it, it actually stimulates the pancreas to secrete insulin, right? And what it will do is it'll actually drop your blood sugar. So if you drop your blood sugar, um, we can see things like tremors and seizures um, because your blood sugar is too low. And if you get enough xylitol, what happens is it can actually affect your liver. Um, this is a little more complicated how this happens, but if some of you remember way back to um, biology when they talked about the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle, that's the cycle that happens in your cells to produce energy, to produce something called ATP, 
which all cells need. And that cycle is run by glucose, right? Well, xylitol doesn't go through that cycle. It bypasses it. So there's no energy produced in your cells. And this is especially problematic in the liver because if liver cells aren't getting energy produced, they die, right? So with high doses of xylitol, we see not only low blood sugar, but we also see liver failure. So if your dog has gotten into xylitol, we're gonna typically induce vomiting and we're gonna take him to the vet to have his liver monitored and his blood sugar. Okay. So let's talk about chocolate, right? This is my favorite kind of poisoning to try to give myself, okay? So when we think about chocolate, the darker it is, the more of a problem it is. With chocolate, we see a continuum of signs. Lower doses can cause stomach upset, and then we can see things like high heart rate, agitation, and as we get into more, we're gonna see things like tremors, seizures, and death. Chocolate is interesting in that it will hang out in the stomach for several hours, um, and it can actually um, have a delayed onset of signs. So the darkness of the chocolate really affects how much needs to be ingested for it to be a problem. So if you look at something like white chocolate here at the top of our chart, white chocolate, it's not really chocolate, right? It's, it's cocoa butter and sugar. It still tastes really good, but it's not something that we expect um, to cause problems in our dogs and cats here. Milk chocolate we can see is about a third as toxic as our dark chocolate and about one seventh as toxic as our unsweetened chocolate, otherwise known as something like Baker's chocolate. The American palate has really changed, right? It used to be mom was stuck with eating the special darks. Um, no one else would eat it. But now a lot of us Americans really like that dark chocolate, right? 70, 75% cocoa. Um, so certainly it doesn't take as much in animals to cause a problem. So that's a great question, right? How much does it take to potentially kill? Well, we've always said that chocolate is poisonous to dogs. Well, the, what we call the median lethal dose, right? Kind of the average amount that it's going to take to kill an animal. For dogs, it's about 300 milligrams per kilo. Humans, it's about a thousand, okay? So that means that dogs are what? A little more than three times more sensitive than people are. So they're more sensitive to the stimulatory effects and in dogs, theobromine hangs out in the body for a much longer period of time instead of being excreted. So it can be much more dangerous to dogs. But truly, if you're a person and you tried hard enough, you could probably give yourself chocolate poisoning. Now, cats are actually even more sensitive than dogs are. But, you know, we're never really saying, oh, you know, chocolate kills cats. It's because cats don't have sweet taste buds. So they'll nibble on the chocolate, right? They'll eat a bit of little the muffin or the chocolate cake, but they don't eat enough to cause things like cardiac and neurologic signs. So cats are actually more sensitive than dogs, but rarely cause problems. So how much is too much, right? This is the important part. Well, in a 20 pound dog, to cause seizures, we would need about nine ounces of milk chocolate. Now remember, this is solid chocolate, right? So if I'm eating something, you know, like this delicious cream filled donut down below, there's not a whole lot of chocolate on there, right? It's mostly filling. However, if I'm eating the bar here up above, definitely it's solid chocolate. So nine ounces of milk, four ounces of dark, or only an ounce and a half of Baker's chocolate. So certainly a 20 pound dog can eat that without a problem. On the human side, to get enough to kill you, you would need to eat about 80 pounds of milk chocolate or about 30 and a half pounds of dark. Now that's to kill you. I can tell you if you sit there and eat an entire five pound Costco bag of um, M&Ms, you will become quite tachycardic, okay? It's uh, something I have done to myself. 
So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about garlic and onions. So this is truly the dose determines the poison. Okay, we say that all the time in toxicology. So this is one thing that a small amount is helpful, right? It's a great antioxidant, but larger amounts can cause things like vomiting and potentially affect our red blood cells and cause anemia. So how much is too much, right? So when we think about onions, right? Dogs need to eat about 15 grams per kilo and cats only about five grams per kilo. Cats are more sensitive to onions and garlic than dogs are, right? And for uh, garlic, you know, we look like we need to eat more than a clove of garlic per kilogram of dog, right? So the way I like to look at this is if, you know, your dog eats that piece of onion that falls off your hamburger, it's not going to be a problem. But if they get into that blooming onion from Outback, it's definitely enough to cause an issue. So the way that these garlic and onion cause anemia is the antioxidant compounds that are in um, the onions and garlic are absorbed into the bloodstream. And antioxidants, unfortunately, at high doses become oxidants. So what they actually do is they damage the membrane of our red blood cells. And we get these little things called Heinz bodies. So these little tiny pieces or little blebs off of the red blood cell. And what happens is it makes those red blood cells very fragile, right? So these red blood cells will rupture and our animal will become anemic, right? Doesn't have enough red blood cells to function normally. So let's talk about bread dough, right? So bread dough, um, and this is yeast bread dough, right? So raw yeast dough. If we think about what yeast does in the dough, it converts sugar into gas, right? That's what causes the raising of our um, dough, but it also produces ethanol, right? So it produces alcohol. So dogs that jump up on the counter and ingest raw yeast dough, this process continues in the stomach and we get drunk, bloated dogs, okay? And they can actually, you know, get enough alcohol um, in their bloodstream to potentially um, die. So certainly if your animal hops up there, eats raw bread dough, we need to go ahead and slow down the yeast by giving them like ice water or ice chips, and then we're going to need to see the veterinarian. So I think that's the last of our toxic foods. So let's move on to our troublesome medications here. So we're going to mention ibuprofen or naproxen, right? Um, some people are like, why do you have this on your holiday hazard list? Well, if you've ever dealt with my family, ibuprofen may be needed. Uh, but also it is the season of, you know, colds. So certainly, um, ibuprofen and naproxen are many times um, around for animals to get into here. So these drugs are what we call non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And in dogs and cats, they can actually cause stomach ulcers and potentially kidney failure. The reason that these are very dangerous to our pets is our pets don't have um, the metabolizing ability to break these down properly. So these compounds are going to stay around in their system for a much longer period than in people. And I'll use a leave as our um, example here. So if a dog is given one leave tablet, it actually takes three days for half of this to leave the body. Okay? So it sticks around much longer than people that are taking it, right? It says last 12 hours. So people take this twice a day. Uh, unfortunately, in dogs, it's highly, highly dangerous, and cats too. So why? What does this do, right? So we take ibuprofen and naproxen to treat pain, right, to decrease inflammation. So the way that these compounds work is they actually decrease these substances called prostaglandins, right? Prostaglandins are involved with pain. So that makes us feel better. 
Unfortunately, prostaglandins also do good things in the body, right? They keep that protective mucus layer in your stomach. They keep blood flow to the stomach. They keep blood flow up to the kidneys. So if we suppress prostaglandins, we're going to get um, stomach ulcers because that protective mucus layer goes away. And we're going to get kidney failure because what it does is it actually causes constriction. So it decreases blood flow through this uh, arterial, through this artery right here. So our kidneys aren't getting enough blood flow. And if you're not getting enough blood flow, you're not getting enough oxygen. And if you don't get oxygen, then your cells will die. So kidney failure and stomach ulcers. So if your pet gets into ibuprofen or naproxen, needs to see the veterinarian, we put them on fluids to protect our kidneys to keep up that blood flow, and we put them on stomach protectants to decrease the risk of stomach ulcers. Now the other pain medication that's really common um, in households is acetaminophen. Um, so with acetaminophen, this is one that truly there's no safe dose in cats. Um, there is potentially a safe dose in dogs, but always, always ask your veterinarian um, before you give any medication, right? It may not be appropriate um, for what you want to give it for. So what does acetaminophen do? Well, it changes the blood so it can't carry oxygen. So an animal that gets into acetaminophen, if you look at their gums, they're kind of a chocolate brown or purplish color, um, and it can also affect the kidneys, excuse me, the liver. So I like little uh, figures like this, so let me go through this with you. So we have acetaminophen, right? The drug that we actually take. And if you're a dog or if you're a person, it's metabolized by this glucuronide or sulfide, and that makes a non-toxic metabolite, right? And everybody's happy. Unfortunately, cats don't do that very well. They're missing these important enzymes to metabolize acetaminophen to non-toxic metabolites. So if you're a cat or if you're an alcoholic, you, you don't have any glucuronide, so acetaminophen goes through the liver through these cytochrome P450 enzymes, and it makes this metabolite called NAPQI. So NAPQI is what causes the liver toxicity in dogs and in people. It does occur in cats, but it's pretty rare. And in people, it also causes kidney toxicity. Now, we also know that acetaminophen makes this um, metabolite called paraaminophenol or PAP, much easier to say. And PAP is what's responsible for that methemoglobinemia, right? For that dark colored blood that can't carry oxygen. So why doesn't this happen in people, right? Why does it happen in dogs and especially in cats? And that has to do with our red blood cells and our hemoglobin in our red blood cells. So in people, they have these, what they're called sulfhydryl groups. So these are reactive groups. And people only have two, all dogs have four, and cats have eight. So that means cats are much more sensitive to that oxidative damage that can occur. Just like with onions and garlic, this happens and it changes the blood so it can't carry oxygen. So if this happens, we take our pets to the vet and they give something, it's antidote called acetylcysteine, and that will help change our blood back to normal and treat our liver uh, toxicity. Okay. So let's talk about household cleaners. So we all need to clean right before people come over to our house. Um, and at the beginning of COVID, we had lots and lots of phone calls about people very worried about using cleaning products in their house, right? You know, they didn't want to hurt their pets. So when we think about cleaning products, there's some questions we need to ask ourselves. Number one, right? What exactly are we cleaning and what is our goal? What is the concentration? Is this something that's highly concentrated and you need to dilute it out with water? Or is it a ready to use product? And of course, what's the pH? 
So for general cleaning, right, we're gonna, you know, um, wipe off the counters or we're going to go ahead and, uh, you know, clean the kitchen sink. Most of these are things like anionic or non-ionic surfactants, right? Surfactants, it's a fancy word for soap. Um, and these can just cause some mild stomach upset, right? If you think about like if your mom ever washed your mouth out with soap when you were little, it doesn't taste good. You kind of drool and spit, but it doesn't cause any severe poisoning situation. So um, our common call was, I just wiped off the counter. The cat jumped up there, walked across it while it was still wet. What happens if she licks her feet? So only mild GI signs, not a big deal. Now disinfectants, these are much more concerning, right? Disinfectants are made to kill things. So we have several different groups of disinfectants. Um, the first one on here are the quaternary ammoniums or our cationic detergents. So these are the same thing that's in that liquid potpourri that we mentioned at the very beginning of the talk that can cause those chemical burns here. We also have our bleaches, our hydrogen peroxides, and then our alcohols, like our alcohol-based hand sanitizers. So with our quaternary ammonium compounds, concentration is key, right? So these ready-to-use wipes are a low concentration of our cationic detergents, right? You can use these in your bare hand. If it, you can use it in your bare hand, it's not going to be a severe toxicity issue for your pets. However, the concentrate down here certainly can be a problem if your animal licks it before it's diluted. So these compounds will cause oral ulcers, right? Remember we looked at the other cat tongue. This one looks kind of similar, right? Our kitty's got some ulcers on her tongue here. So if your cat or dog has accidentally licked one of these things while it's concentrated, we want to dilute it out with either a little bit of milk or water. Um, and if you are actually seeing burns, then that does mean we need a trip to the veterinarian. These animals may need pain medication, um, potentially antibiotics um, and anti-ulcer medications. Now with bleaches in the household, regular household bleach is about three to 6%. And if an animal is exposed to that, it can cause you know, some mild irritation to the gums and to the digestive tract. So we could see vomiting and drooling. But if you use ultra bleach, right, that's greater than 6% hypochlorite, that can actually cause oral burns. So always make sure to keep these products away from our pets. And if you use a color safe bleach, um, color safe bleach when it meets liquid is hydrogen peroxide, right? So hydrogen peroxide, the stuff that we put on our cuts and scrapes, um, or at higher concentrations, we use it to bleach our hair, um, can potentially cause um, some corrosive damage, right? Burns to our mouth and to our um, GI tract here. So once again, we dilute these out with milk or water and see the veterinarian if there's any burns. We also have corrosive agents, right? Acids and alkalis. If you think about like those iron out or anti-rust compounds or drain openers, those tend to be very um, high in pH or very low in pH. And these will definitely cause um, oral ulcers here, um, drooling, uh, gagging, pain. So if we see that, once again, dilution is the solution. You offer them milk or water and you go ahead and take them in to see the veterinarian. I threw in ice melt, uh, knowing you're located in LA, probably not a big problem for most of you, but just to mention, if you do travel, um, ice melts are not all created the same. Um, ice melts that are calcium chloride based are very uh, corrosive and can cause oral burns also, just like um, our cleaning products can. The ones, most of them are made with things like uh, table salt, which is sodium chloride, potassium chloride, and magnesium chloride, which um, can cause electrolyte abnormalities if enough is ingested, so vomiting. 
Um, but there are pet safe ones out there um, that are based um, off of urea or zeolite, which are clays, and those are relatively non-toxic um, to our dogs and cats. Uh, urea can be a problem if uh, like you had a pet, you know, pygmy goat or something like that. So as the holidays come around, just make sure to pet proof, right? You or I know not to leave our backpack or our purse on the floor, um, but grandma may not know that. And probably grandma's purse is the worst place for pets to be. So I think we're gonna open the floor for questions. Wonderful, Dr. Wismer. Thank you so much. That was super helpful information. Um, really excellent uh, talk and very practical information. Um, maybe not the ice melt part for us in California, but it does get very cold in certain parts of California here. There's, we get, uh, especially if you go east, it gets, it gets pretty cold. So, and there's snow in, uh, in just up north. So let's open up uh, the chat for questions. Um, and let's uh, and let's see if we get some questions. I know that um, xylitol is something that a lot of people don't really know about, and it is. I now every time I go to a gas station or I see it in all the gum now, it's much more common than it used to be even five or ten years ago. Um, I, one question is what I think you mentioned this a little bit. What what is? Can you name the top three kind of phone calls that you get to the poison control hotline? Sure. So when we think about poison control, um, about, what is it, 86% of our calls are about dogs. And the three most common things we get calls about are chocolate, ibuprofen, and then number three is actually xylitol. So we covered all of those today. Fantastic. And I know I get this question a lot being a veterinarian and people text me all the time. What to do at home if you need to induce vomiting? And when should you not try to do it at home and just rush in? And when should you try to do it at home? And then how do you do it? Yeah. So. And cat versus dog. <laughs> it's a lot right. of question, but. <laughs> yes. No, that's, that's, it's a lot of good information. So when we think about cats, we'll start with cats. There really isn't anything safe at home to induce vomiting in cats. So cats, right, they vomit all the time when you don't want them to. Um, but even trying to make them vomit in the veterinary clinic is problematic. Um, so many times with cats, we skip the inducing vomiting step and we go to other methods of decontamination like activated charcoal. Now, dogs, on the other hand, they're much more cooperative at home. And um, what we use at home to induce vomiting is hydrogen peroxide. Now, that said, it's the 3% stuff, right? The stuff in the brown bottle that you put on your cuts and scrapes. It needs to be a fresh bottle because we need it to bubble when it hits organic matter. If it doesn't bubble, you're just giving bad tasting water. You also need to make sure to dose it correctly, right? We give one milliliter per pound up to um, 45 milliliters, which is three tablespoons. And you could potentially repeat that once, right? But we want to make sure that what you're inducing vomiting for is, you know, number one, do we need to be doing that? And number two, is it safe, right? With things like cleaning products, anything that can cause oral burns, we don't induce vomiting with because if it burns on the way down, it's gonna burn coming back up and make things worse. So we don't induce vomiting with those. Um, so we typically will you know, have you either you know, contact your veterinarian and they'll say, yes, we can induce vomiting or no, we can't. Um, or you could cause po call poison control and we'll you know, say, oh yes, this is something and we have time or no, this is something that could potentially cause right, seizures really quickly. Don't waste your time inducing vomiting. Go to the vet right away. And then just even more practically, how does one give a dog, uh, you know, three tablespoons of peroxide? Right. You know, can you, <laughs> if you don't have a syringe at home to shove it in their mouth or, right. um, and, then, and then following up to that question, should you feed them first? Um, I know in the vet hospital, a lot of times we would give a dog a big meal to try to expand the stomach to make the vomit 
more vomit come up? Should people do that at home or no? Yeah. So if they haven't eaten recently, we at least have you give like a handful of kibble or a slice of bread uh, to go ahead and uh, induce vomiting. So how to get the peroxide into your dog um, is going to depend upon your dog, right? Some of them, you just make them sit and you can take, um, you know, a turkey baster or even a little plastic cup, pour it in the side of their mouth and they swallow just fine. Other dogs, you know, you would potentially lose a limb trying to do that. Um, so in those, what we usually try is we'll take a shallow bowl, we'll spread a little peanut butter on the bottom, put the, uh, put the peroxide on top of that so they have to drink the peroxide to get to the peanut butter. So that usually works the first time. The second time, it does not. <laughs> good, good question. Good uh, points. I, I think that's excellent. Um, somebody asked a really a question that is not ridiculous. She said this is ridiculous, but it's not because we we talked about this with chocolate about how much chocolate. So if we're talking about um, onions or mm -hmm. garlic, mm -hmm. and if there is onion and garlic in a meal and then the dog eats the meal, like say there's a little bit of turkey with onion inside or a little bit of garlic on top of something, um, you know, how, how should we worry about that? Right, the answer is no, you don't need to worry about that. Um, so let's say for our 20 pound dog, right? I don't know why I always use 20 pounds, right? It's a nice Shih Tzu sized dog, right? So for that dog in onions, they would need to eat about um, right, almost six ounces of onions. Um, so a pretty significant amount to get us to the dose where we're going to see problems with our blood. Um, lower doses, we could see some stomach upset, but not a big deal, right? So yeah, if something was cooked or, oh my gosh, there was you know onion in the broth, I didn't know, it's not going to be enough to be a problem. Okay, really good question though. Um, what about cleaning products that cause problems, but do they, can they cause problems just by exposure or inhalation rather than ingestion? Um, skin irritation, paw licking, that kind of thing. Right. So with most of our cleaning products, the issue is actual oral ingestion, right? Or dermal contact, if it's something that can cause burns. Um, you know, a lot of these products are highly scented because um, we want our house to smell clean. Um, those just inhalation is not a problem. Now, that said, right? Medicine's never black and white. It's always shades of gray. A place where inhalation can be a problem is occasionally what will happen is we'll have a dog that, you know, is in the laundry room um, and the bleach spills, right? And there's a lot of bleach in the air. They're trapped in there for a period of time and they breathe those concentrated fumes that can cause a chemical uh, pneumonitis, so chemical pneumonia. But in most cases, using it correctly in your house is not a problem. Got it, got it. Um, any problems with foods that have vinegar like pickles or capers or anything like that? No, fortunately, <laughs> not a problem for dogs and not a problem for us either. Those are some of my favorite things. And, you know, just uh, thinking about it from somebody who's going to the vet with their pet, how do we veterinarians uh, induce vomiting at the hospital and why is it different than giving them peroxide? Sure. So in the hospital, um, what we use typically in dogs is a compound called apomorphine. Okay. So some of you may be like morphine, right? It is in the same family, but yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't give you the same high. Um, what it does is it actually stimulates the vomiting center in the brain, um, the CRTZ, chemoreceptive trigger zone. And by using apomorphine, it causes them to vomit. Now, sometimes we actually have to reverse it with naloxone, which you may have heard is like the antidote for things like heroin or other uh, morphine or opioid um, type medication. So we do usually need to do that in the hospital. So Occasionally we do use peroxide in the hospital though, if we have a compound that affects that vomiting center, right? Then we need to use something that acts locally in the stomach as opposed to something that acts centrally in the brain. So probably the number one substance that we now use peroxide for in the vet hospital is marijuana, right? Think about marijuana, it's an anti-emetic, right? People take it when they're undergoing chemo because it reduces nausea and vomiting. Well, 
it also makes our vomiting medications not work. So we use peroxide. Great. Since you brought it up, should we just do a quick little... <laughs> Let's talk about marijuana? Sure. Let's sure. do a quick little 30 second, what is the most important thing people should know about? Right. Um, Keep and, your and maybe, you know, also from, from, from our perspective as veterinarians, what it was like 10 years ago compared to what it is now, you know, you used to be able to, a dog would walk in the hospital and you could tell if it was a marijuana toxicity from across the room because it just, there was a classic symptoms, classic signs. You just walked them back and you gave them the morphine and you moved on. Now it's like, it's a whole different world. And maybe you can speak to that for just a minute. Yeah. So with the legalization of marijuana, um, the THC content of marijuana has really increased, right? Um, I like to say it's not our parents' weed, right? Or our grandparents' weed for some of us. Um, it's much more concentrated. And especially if we start talking about things like edibles, it's extremely concentrated compared to the plant material. So with cats, cats are still most likely to get into plant material, right? They're gonna eat the joint. They're gonna eat the marijuana out of the baggie. Um, dogs, it's all about the edibles, especially the ones that are chocolate based. And dogs don't read the label that says that that little chocolate bar is actually eight doses, right? They're going to go ahead and eat the entire thing. Um, so they get a large dose of THC. And you're right, they have that very classic presentation. Um, initially, they're wobbly, like they're drunk. They're hyperesthetic, right? They overreact to sound and to movement, and they dribble urine. Um, so, yeah, you used to see that, and you'd be like, hm, it's a marijuana dog, right? Um, today, with the more concentrated products, we can see these animals come in potentially comatose. Um, and also uh, with like low blood pressure, low body temperature, um, and it's rare, but they can actually potentially die from it. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a very scary situation now. And then you don't always get a clear history from people when they bring the dog in. And so you're just kind of left guessing and trying to figure it out. Yeah. Um, a question that I have here uh, is what is the toxic dose of steroids long-term for dogs? Um, mm. So that's really going to vary from pet to pet, right? I mean, some animals need steroids, like if they have something called Addison's disease, where they have a lack of steroids in their body. Um, and when we talk about steroids, all steroids aren't created equally, right? So that's something I really can't speak to without, you know, knowing more specifics about the case. No, I understand completely. Okay, so... I think that's probably a good wrap up time for our questions. Those were excellent questions and it opened up even more discussion. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much everyone for your questions. Uh, before we wrap things up, I'd like to extend an invitation to some of our upcoming family friendly online events, um, particularly two events coming up next Saturday at four o'clock, we're hosting a fun filled holiday kids party. It's gonna be an online celebration of the holidays featuring pets and puppets and games and more. It's gonna be super festive and fun for the kids. Um, we're also offering a special Pet Space uh, Kids Winter Camp online beginning December 28th. Uh, similar, similar to our popular summer sessions, it's an opportunity for children ages eight to 11 to learn more about the human animal bond while playing games and virtually meeting some amazing animals. Uh, both registration links can be found on our website, annenbergpetspace.org. Thank you again, Dr. Wismer, for taking the time to share all of this great information with us. Um, and thank you to all of our viewers for joining us this afternoon and continuing to support Wallace Annenberg Pet Space. Thank you all, we hope to see you all soon. Dr. Wismer, stay safe. Thank you so much again for your time. Thank you for inviting me. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Take care and we'll see you all soon. Check out our website.